So, I welcome yeah. you. Yes, I welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, to our uh, fellowship weekend. This is the Conflict Transformation Weekend on the 23rd day of October in the year 2021. And uh, this session is on uh, our Conflict Transformation Coaching Weekend with uh, Reverend Dr. Father Peter Mbaro of the Catholic University of South Africa, the Center for uh, Social Justice and Ethics. Uh, he is the director of the center and we thank him for joining us for this uh, particular session. We will have two segments uh, or two lectures on conflict transformation coaching uh, this weekend and uh, the next weekend on October 30th, uh, 2021 and October 30th will be at 10 a.m. And uh, we start off as we do with the words of our Kenyan national anthem and I will lead in Kiswahili, Wimbo wa Taifa, kwa lugha ya Kiswahili, the first stanza. E mungu nguvu yetu ilete baraka kwetu haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukae na ndugu amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi once again i welcome all of you colleagues to our session um, today and we invite dr uh, mbaro who is taking us through the session today uh, dr mbaro we may also uh, request that you may kindly uh, please uh, uh, lead us in a word of prayer now, now that you are uh, here with us for this session today. And we thank you for joining us. The lecture hour is yours. Karibu sana, Dr. Mbaru. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God and Father, this morning we thank you for the gift of our life. We thank you for the gift of our new day. We thank you for the gift of many blessings that you have showered upon us. And as we engage in this session, God, our Father, we ask you to enlighten our minds and our hearts through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so that we may become true mediators uh, for peaceful coexistence in our society, for your glory and for the good of everyone that we serve in our lives. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you very much, Medita um, Wangari. So today I will um, focus on conflict transformation, uh, taking into account uh, two aspects, restorative justice and retributive uh, justice. Uh, because uh, uh, Professor uh, Peter Yeshure of Good Memory um, enumerated quite a number of areas that perhaps we would like to focus on in our efforts to understand our responsibility and our role in uh, peace building in our society, and especially through uh, conflict uh, management and transformation. And therefore, he listed down um, the restorative justice and the retributive justice as two uh, areas that uh, perhaps we need to focus on. And therefore, today I will concentrate on that and come next uh, weekend, uh, we will focus on um, conflict transformation and sampling on uh, uh, reconciliation. So today we will look at uh, restorative justice and uh, retributive justice. But I make an introduction first by noting that conflict is ever present in the world in diverse order of beings, but more among people at different stages of life in diverse socio cultural, economic, political stratum, and professions. Conflict uh, are inevitable because diverse personal interests socio cultural economic political and national backgrounds beliefs and value systems uh, come to play at every point of decision making process and action hence uh, conflicts are uh, conflicts are as old as humanity and it is therefore worth noting that uh, the most important thing is not whether or not there are conflicts in different sectors in our human life, but how these conflicts are being handled. That is what is most important. So handled ineffectively, uh, conflicts uh, can lead to disintegration of peaceful coexistence of different people, destroy team spirit, 
and if they compromise individual or group productivity and uh, can even destroy uh, community life. Uh, however, the opposite is also true that with the right management, it can also be transformed and therefore be used as an effective tool for achieving goals. Conflict can be handled either constructively or destructively. This implies then that good conflict management is crucial in resolving um, conflicts among the various individuals and groups of people in our communities. We have to take this truth into account that conflict are being counterproductive due to bad management and transformation. This is true also once those charged with the responsibility to intervene fail to address it effectively and efficiently uh, through the exercise of dialogue and the conflict management skills, thus preventing normal conflict uh, from escalating into chronic uh, conflict. What then is conflict management and transformation is important uh, for us as mediators uh, to uh, uh, focus on. So conflict management and transformation may be described as an intervention aimed at preventing escalation or negative effects, especially violent or ongoing uh, conflicts or conflicts that add up uh, being chronic among uh, members, members of, uh, of the community. The people, uh, groups, organizations, and states respond to conflict in different ways. Among these are the restorative and retributive ways uh, which can also be referred to as forms of justice processes. Today, there has been a big and continuous debate on how conflict, especially those arising from crime, can be effectively and efficiently handled to assist individuals and communities live peaceably and experience integral human development. Following this, we now look at the two methods or processes which are in use today, which are being recommended by various uh, peace builders. The, uh, retributive and restorative justice. As opening remarks, we note that uh, an integration of the current system of retributive justice with the recently developed approach of restorative justice offers a promise to reduce the harshness of contemporary sentencing. Uh, critics is, uh, to such an approach argue that uh, there is a conflict between the reconciliation objective of restorative justice and the condemnatory uh, objective of uh, retributive justice. We have to recognize that these are two processes for dealing with uh, crime and that each have distinct each has distinctive uh, features however it is argued that there is a firm basis for fighting uh, complementary in the operation of these two processes which ultimately, ultimately have the same goal of justice for the offender victim and the community let us look at restorative, restorative justice. Restorative justice has become a worldwide phenomenon in criminal justice systems. Restorative justice focuses mainly on the harm done to people when a crime has been committed than looking at what laws or rules have been broken as in traditional criminal justice systems. One of the most prominent uh, practitioners and advocate of um, uh, restorative justice, Paul Zell, identified the participants and goals of restorative justice in simple terms. And therefore he said, restorative justice is a process to involve, to the extent possible, those who have a stake in a specific offense and to carefully 
and to collectively identify and address harms, needs, and obligations in order that one put things as right as possible. And by definition, we can say that uh, restorative justice is a process whereby all the parties with a stake in a particular fence come together to resolve collectively how to deal with the aftermath of the offense and its implication for their future. The minimum elements of a rest restorative justice process involves a process in which the victims and their offenders meet face to face and that they come to some understanding which constitutes the outcome that they have determined. The process of uh, restorative justice occurs through deliberation between victim, offender, and facilitator or mediator directed at promoting healing of the victim and secondarily restoring the offender. In the first place, we find that the process focuses on two main actors, the victim and the offender. And secondly, the mediator, whose role is to facilitate or mediate the dialogue on behalf of the entire community that seeks the restoration of previous relationships. With the restorative justice, those who have been harmed and those who have done the harm are at the center of the mediation process. A restorative justice approach to crime and resulting conflict involves um, participation of all parties to the crime, namely victim, offender, and the community. This is victim's part of helping the offenders uh, understand how their offensive behavior actually affects them as the criminal behavior has enormous impact on victims' daily life, work, health, sleep of the victim, and so on. It also affects members of the victim's family and the community. Hence, we find that on the one hand, restorative justice is directed towards healing the victim and the community which is usually affected by the offense committed against the individual, indiv individual victim. On the one, on, and on the other hand, the healing of the offender by rebuilding his moral or her moral and social sense. In other words, the restorative process seeks to compensate the victim, repair the harm, and facilitate the offender's remorse and healing. The restorative justice perspective focuses on the injury experienced by the victims as the primary concern. Following this, the offender is encouraged to understand the harm that has been caused and to understand the full consequences of their criminal uh, conduct. Rather than being the subject of court-imposed punishment, the offender in the restorative justice process is encouraged to take responsibility for the offense, uh, to agree to remedial action necessary to repair the harm done uh, to the victim, um, to the family, and to the community, and to satisfy the victim and community by remorse and assurance of future uh, safety. Victim and offender can come to an agreement uh, with the assistance of, of a mediator with the offender, acknowledging the injury cost along, uh, along with the acknowledgement of the offender's responsibility of what can be done to restore a sense of justice and recover of lost relationships. To a common response of the offender, uh, to the, no, they agreed upon 
a response of the offender can involve compensation to the victim, compensation or service to other victims of similar offenses or to the wider community or where appropriate traditional punishment as provided in the penal code. Punishment therefore should meet appropriate retributive and rehabilitative objectives. In addition, restorative justice offers both an alternative understanding of crime and new ways of responding to it. Restorative justice views crime as more than simply a violation of the law, an offense against governmental authority. Crime indeed, it violates human relationships and injures victims, communities, and even the offender himself or herself. Each party is hurt in different ways and each has different needs that must be met in order for healing to begin and to um, end successfully. Crime disturbs a society's sense of trust and often results in feelings of suspicion, uh, separation, and discrimination. Restorative justice helps us to understand that crime or offense committed creates rifts between friends, relatives, neighbors, and communities. It often produces a hostile relationship where no previous relationship existed. An often overlooked result of crime or offense committed is that the victim and the offender have a relationship. They have a painfully negative experience in common after the offense is committed. Hence, left unresolved, that hostile relationship negatively affects the welfare of both the victim and the offender, and also it extends to the community. Justice, therefore, requires a restoration uh, for victims, offenders, and communities affected by crime. To promote healing, society must, there, must respond to the needs of the victimized uh, parties, as well as to the responsibilities of offenders. Therefore, there are three primary stakeholders in the restorative justice process that mediation has to always consider, namely the victims, offenders, and their communities. Its process then include victim-offender mediation, conferencing and circles, restorative outcomes, which include apology, amends to the victim, and amends to the community. It is worth noting that the idea the ideal outcome of the process of restorative justice benefits both the victim and the offender. This outcome is possible because both victim and offender are positively affected by the process. The experience offers victims much greater sense of peace and accountability. Offenders equally who are willing to face the harmful consequences of their actions are more ready to accept responsibility, make reparations, and rebuild their lives. So examples of restorative justice outcomes therefore include, as we conclude this part on restorative justice, it includes restitution, community service, victim offender reconciliation. And we will address the topic on reconciliation uh, in our next Saturday's uh, session. Let's look at retributive justice. Retributive, retributive justice is a response to criminal behavior that focuses on the punishment of lawbreakers and the compensation of victims. In general, the severity of the punishment is proportionate to the seriousness of the crime. 
Contemporary criminal punishment is dominated by the retribu retributive objective of punishment. Retribution is based on the concept of lex tarionis, that is the law of retaliation. At, at its core is the principle of equal and direct retribution, as even expressed in the Holy Scriptures, Exodus 21, 24, as an eye for an eye, therefore destroying the eye of a person of equal social that meant that one's own eye would be put out. Retribution is often mistakenly understood as seeking vengeance by inflicting suffering upon an offender. But instead, retribution should, uh, needs to be understood as the justification for criminal punishment. Retributive justice has been related to the institution of criminal punishment. Retribution involves the imposition of an appropriate sanction or punishment for violation of the penal law. The penal or retributive criminal proceeding aims at determining guilt and imposing an appropriate punishment. The penal system effectuating retributive uh, justice aims to impose punishment or deprivation proportionate to the offense which has been committed. The criminal process is punitive by seeking to impose a punishment, a deprivation or restriction on the part of the offender. This traditional penal approach to crime or offense committed views the state it views the state as the primary offended party or victim of the criminal offense and place, places those harmed by the offense and the community in passive or subsidiary law, just as witness or juror. We note that retributive justice often relieves the offender uh, from the obligation to acknowledge guilt or even to repay the victim and the community or compensate the victim or the community. And at times, it is often viewed as a compensation to the state whose law has been broken. But in contrast to restorative justice, restorative justice seeks um, uh, to right the wrong that has been committed and repair the damage that has been sustained by victims, offenders, and communities. However, when incarceration is necessary for public safety, it should be part of the resolution. And therefore, retributive uh, justice equally does some kind of reparation uh, when it comes to the offended parties. Let us look at how these two can be reconciled, restorative and retributive justice, because the two are necessary in our uh, conflict um, transformation process. The debate as to whether we are to recommend one form of uh, justice as the only viable means of resolving conflict in our society has been on for a long time. In other words, there has been always a debate. Do we go for restorative justice or retributive justice? As mediators in conflict transformation, we need to underline that the two systems are important to consider, though the restorative one should always be highly recommended for mediators and for restitution of relationships and peaceful coexistence. However, to most successfully address the need for conflict transformation, taking into account the needs of victims, offenders, and the state 
a combination of restorative and retributive justice should be considered essential and be implemented. This necessar necessary combination addresses the interest of all parties to a criminal event, including the victim and the community, the offender and the state, which looks at the social harm done by the offense committed against a penal uh, uh, code. Restorative justice addresses the needs of the victim for reparation and restoration. Similarly, restorative justice addresses the needs of the offender for forgiveness and reintegration into the community. Further, retributive justice addresses the need of the state to maintain the criminal law through enforcement and punishment. And therefore, finally, we note that retributive uh, justice restores the offender's moral state as a result of the imposition and acceptance of the prescribed uh, punishment. As we conclude, we are invited therefore as mediators to help people learn to manage conflict, seeking eventually to transform them into points of learning and growing as persons and as peacemakers. Since conflict can take different forms involving different people, it is important that we, that we endeavor to channel conflict towards a good end, thus transformation, taking either of the two uh, processes of justice, though recommending re 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 restorative justice as the most um, viable way of uh, recovering the relationships. Conflict is natural, and it is up to each one of us to respond to conflict situations quickly and professionally. Since we cannot imagine that uh, conflict um, will uh, die a natural death, we cannot ignore whatever type of conflict in our society and wish it would therefore die a natural death, since this can have irreparable effects on the parties involved, the community and its performance in different dimensions of life. Over and above all, each one of us must therefore know how to handle his or her own conflict uh, before he or she becomes a mediator in conflicts involving other parties, either him or her. The main objective of conflict management and transformation is to reconcile individuals, reconcile groups, reconcile communities for peaceful coexistence, for integral human development. And we will look at the topic on reconciliation, as I have promised, in our next meeting come next uh, weekend, God willing. Thank you very much, mediators, um, for listening. God bless you. Over to you, wow. mediator Wangari. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Mbaru. And I believe this has been uh, you know, quite quite a lecture, and uh, we are we are definitely uh, looking forward to uh, the next one that is um, coming up um, next week uh, uh, from from this particular one. Um, so, colleagues, um, uh, today on the twenty third day of the of October in the year two thousand and twenty one. Our session today is on conflict transformation. Our conflict transformation coaching weekend, as part of the ongoing uh, fellowship national certificate for mediators, and we have two sessions uh, this Saturday and also the next Saturday. Uh, the session will be on uh, at ten at ten a.m. That is on um, October October thirtieth, and we are all invited to these uh, bonus sessions, which uh, Dr. Mbaru has. Uh, uh, graciously set up for us. So today, Dr. Mbaru has covered with us uh, retributive, uh, restorative justice and retributive justice. Um, and this is uh, uh, part of our, our gearing as uh, developing ourselves as conflict transformation uh, mediators. Dr. Mbaru, it was quite interesting to hear from you when you placed the two, because it's like you placed the two on a balance and then you still took us and told us that, you know, these two can be put together and that, that they can be they, they can be they can be harmonized and i think it would also be quite interesting next week when now you focus on uh, the the area of um, reconciliation just so that we can this this hours yeah, these three hours 
they seem to be probably there there's a way that as 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 mediators we can be able to just work with them especially um in the communities something interesting that you bring uh, you bring in when we look at the two the, the two yeah. is that um restorative justice there's a focus on the victim the offender and the community and uh, that 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 is uh, that is quite interesting and i th I, I believe even for um, for the uh, professional mediators uh, it would be quite interesting for us to to you know, to be just be able to um, hear let's say like for um, um, instances of examples whereby the, this uh, restorative justice has probably or could be applied a situation where this could be applied something that could be quite practical for us as professional mediators um, the reason of interest uh, for this uh, further um, in this is that uh, uh, we, we we seek to um, enable mediators to be able to be uh, taking their game higher and higher. And that is why we are not, when you talk about conflict transformation mediators, when you look at institutions such as the United Nations uh, and, uh, um, and other uh, United, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, programs, whether it's uh, the, 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 the Women, Peace and Security as a focus, plus also just other programs like the United Nations. Um, I think the, a greater understanding of these contexts and concepts that we are talking about on conflict transformation would support our mediators to be able to position themselves to serve um, in such in, in 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 the work that now comes with like such institutions, such inter, such institutions, and also other international institutions, and also locally even here in a country like Kenya, as we even look at um, we head into the the, the elections. Um, the other part is that. Um, and which I will also request for a bit more expounding is that when you've talked about retributive justice, you've talked about that um, the, the, the design of retributive, of retributive justice is that the state is the one that has been wronged. Uh, if you may also just kindly just expound a little bit more on that, um, on that context or that concept, perhaps even uh, any illustrations that may help us to be able to just, yeah, to get it a bit, um, a bit uh, clearer on uh, the context of, you know, how, how is the state being wronged? And I mean, how is it, is, or is it because of the design of the system that the system decides that the state is the one that is uh, wronged? So over to you, Dr. Ambaro, with that, and then we can come for, we can come back for more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matito Wangari, for uh, that um, acknowledgement. Uh, I think one thing we have to understand is that, um, um, Restorative uh, justice has always been uh, uh, left out in uh, the process of conflict uh, management and transformation, and I think this is one of the areas that um, uh, the mediator um, needs to really to focus on. Um, bearing in mind that mediation is uh, an aspect of, of alternative uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, where we uh, expected not to very much uh, incline on following the judicial um, system of um, uh, conflict resolution and the conflict. Um, okay, let, let me uh, start on that uh, conflict resolution. And therefore, uh, when you talk about restorative uh, uh, justice, it's where three parties come as uh, equal, um, uh, you know, players, the victim, the offender, and the community. For example, you know that we have had quite a number of um, large disputes in, uh, in, in, our, in our country and in different uh, communities and families that are not even facing each other. And even we have had incidences of violent, um, uh, attacks, uh, one family attacking another, or even uh, people of uh, uh, within the same family, uh, maybe brothers and sisters or brothers and brothers. And when the process goes the retributive way, then it takes, um, the, of course, the penal um, law uh, direction. And what happens is that the offender is punished according to the law. But the question that always remains is, has that penal process repaired relationships that need to exist 
between or to be experienced between these two uh, people, the victim uh, and the offender, and plus also the community. And the answer has always been no. Uh, though there may be some kind of satisfaction on the part of the victim, uh, the one who perhaps has been incarcerated, if you use that term, either for one or two years or three years, whatever the sentence or the period of sentence, uh, that person may have bitterness. Uh, and as the person leaves or completes the term of uh, imprisonment, may continue on with that hostile relationship. And therefore, restorative justice comes in to bring healing on all the three parties. And also uh, take into account that it also brings in the aspect of restoration uh, of the lost good, whether it is the social good or material good or even spiritual emotional good. And I think that's why uh, restorative justice uh, is always um, uh, taken to be uh, an alternative way of uh, resolving uh, uh, this uh, conflict. That we experience. So I can give that as an example when it comes to like, for example, labor disputes that we have in our communities. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for that guidance, uh, Dr. Mbaro. The other uh, inquiry that we have is specifically on uh, the, as on, on the, on the area of uh, uh, fam of family disputes, and uh, specifically, it is okay. It's our comment or a question: If you may kind um, uh, kindly explore family disputes and mediation in the context of uh, restorative justice and retributive justice. Probably, when it comes maybe to family situations, mediators deal with uh, matters that have to do with uh, child custody, families that are either sep separating or couples, couples that are uh, separating or are in. Uh, transition in their family situation, and there are aspects of uh, child maintenance, child custody. So, it probably may just highlight to us how these two uh, systems, yeah, may either apply. And yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Wangari. Uh, um, family disputes are, are quite many, and I would say that uh, you know. It's an area that requires a lot of attention, a lot of study. Um, I did my dissertation on um, family as the center for peace building, or peace education. And when I was going through that uh, research, I discovered that there are quite a number of um, family disputes that need to be, to be understood, especially by those people who look at alternative uh, means of uh, uh, resolving disputes. And you have given just a few of those um, ex uh, disputes, like for example, the separation of uh, couples, custody of uh, children, maintenance of the upkeep of uh, the young ones. And I think as mediators, we have again to take into account the three. That means the persons who are involved, who are maybe the husband, the wife, the children who are involved, but bearing in mind that the community always come in in order to, uh, to start on the part of the child who may not have a voice uh, to speak. But you see the social good of the child is uh, defended by the community. And that's why the community will always come in uh, even in a dispute that is family-based or the, the, the dispute that seems to be of the nuclear members of the family. And then mediator uh, who comes in here has to look at the good of the three. That means the husband, the wife, and the children who definitely uh, would say that represent, are represented uh, by the community and try to see how interest, uh, how interest of each one of these uh, parties can be advocated and defended. And therefore, it's upon the mediator to facilitate a dialogue for uh, resolving the kind of dispute that 
is being experienced within that community. And therefore, the mediator goes in not with already uh, what we call the uh, preconceived um, position or uh, decision, but goes there to listen to all the parties and therefore come up with a practical um, uh, resolution that will help each one benefit uh, from uh, the decision that is taken. And therefore, look at the long and the, uh, you know, what we call the future of uh, uh, each uh, party involved. That's what I can say about you know, dispute regarding um, uh, custody of children, upkeep of children, you know, sometimes these days we are talking about even the sharing of property uh, because all members of the family are contributors at once the upkeep of each um, a member of the family. That's what I can say for the time being. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, contrib for that contribution, uh, Dr. Mbaru. And uh, uh, if, if you may allow me uh, uh, to kindly highlight uh, one of the uh, fellowship blog articles uh, by uh, one of the fellows in the program, that is uh, Steve Mutinda Mutembo. And uh, his uh, fellowship blog article is on uh, mediation and murder cases in Kenya. So if I may just read uh, the extract that has been shared in the chat. Yes. There have been a few cases where courts have allowed parties to use alternative methods of dispute resolution in murder cases. Uh, in the case of Republic versus Mohammed, uh, Abdao Mohammed, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the accused was discharged from a murder case after the accused family and the deceased family reached an out of court settlement. The accused was facing a murder charge. The families of the accused and the deceased had reached a settlement after some compensation was made and rituals conducted. The family of the deceased informed the prosecution by a letter that they did not wish, that they did not wish uh, to pursue the matter. The prosecution made an oral application to have the matter marked, uh, they, they made an oral application to have the matter marked as settled, citing article 159 of the constitution. Dr. Mbaro, uh, I don't know what your comments would be because I know this has been uh, one of the cases in Kenya and, and, and I know, I mean, that has been quite an uh, interesting one. And yeah, I don't know what your comments uh, would be on specifically on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, restorative justice um, has borrowed a lot from uh, what you can call the traditional um, method of dispute resolution that uh, has been practiced by many communities uh, in the past, where dialogue is encouraged between the victim and the offender's uh, family or even the community. And when we talk about alternative dispute resolution mechanism, uh, this has been borrowed a lot from the traditional African setting. And I think this case may have also taken into account some of the old practices among uh, or in the community that was involved in this, uh, in this case or the families uh, that were involved in this case. And I'll say that settlement of um, a dispute outside court has been quite a practice. It's only that um, this one where there was um, a loss of life, um, Amanda, uh, then came out as an extraordinary uh, allowance of a settlement of a case outside court. But it has always been uh, practiced in African communities where even when a murder has taken place, the communities are encouraged to come together in order to preempt um, the, uh, the sentiment or the attitudes or practice of uh, a revenge. And therefore, communities are encouraged families to uh, settle this by having a dialogue, looking at the compensation that need to be done, apologies are done, and rituals of cleansing are also done in order to settle 
uh, that dispute. And therefore, it has been a, a common practice, though uh, for a court of law to uh, acknowledge this and recommend it uh, has been definitely um, taken as something extraordinary. But in the past, we'll say it has been a practice. And though we may be careful to not allow some of these things to happen without the due process being followed. Otherwise, what has been happening in some of our communities is that even issues of child abuse, issues, issues of child molestation, uh, has that have uh, have been uh, you know buried or covered in the name of family settling, and therefore the whole process, instead of being an open process, becomes like a process where things are being covered. So I think it is um, something that needs to be um, acknowledged as a good, as an alternative um, dispute resolution mechanism, rather than following the long process. Uh, that FEMA code prescribes. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for your, yeah, for that, just uh, giving us your, your views on, on, on this. Uh, and uh, we have a comment that retributive justice is there from Emerald Videga. Retributive justice is based on the judicial system that focuses on establishing blame or guilt and subsequently punishing the offender. The offender is then presumed to be accountable for the crime after being punished. I believe this is uh, what uh, what you did highlight when mm. you spoke about yeah when you spoke about uh, what uh, uh, retributive justice is and uh, talking about that it's a state that has been injured uh, in in in, the, in in that particular context. So um, uh, well, uh, Dr. Mbaro uh, key uh, during the course of uh, us pursuing the the fellowship program is that uh, the fellows are. Uh, preparing articles, um, and that is from where we did share. Uh, we've shared um, the the blog, uh, the, the the extract of the blog article by uh, still by Steve Mutembo, who's a fellow on the program. Plus, also other fellows have also uh, done the same, and others still uh, are, 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 are doing that. And uh, what would be your 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 contribution to uh, the 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 blog articles, or just the general way of the thinking? Because fellows are preparing these articles as part of developing their own framework in the context of conflict transformation as conflict transformation mediators. Uh, what would be your either your you know your, your your comment or contribution in when when developing or coming up with a framework around conflict transformation, what would be you know the, where 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 should the minds of you know we on the fellowship program, where should our minds go or where should they not go and or where should they come? Yeah and that if you may kindly just um, advise us uh, on that as we get on to um, closing the session, just so that we can be able to build our frameworks um, with a conflict transformation um, mindset. Thank you, Dr. Mbaru. Oh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Zawangari. I think what I will say is that um, the framework should be very much centralized on um, the area of uh, expertise of each one of the fellows. Look at your area, or we can say, let them look at the areas of their profession and the area of expertise, and ask this one question. From my position as a professional, how can I effectively and efficiently uh, manage and transform conflict? I think with that, that major question, one can maneuver and write an article or a blog article, and even an article that will um, meet the standard of uh, being uh, published in a revered journal. So I go back again, look at your area or as a fellow, your area of profession and your area of expertise and ask this question, how can I effectively and efficiently manage and transform a conflict? With that, then one can comfortably write, drawing from one's experiences and also projecting what 
one can do um, in his or her area of uh, operation. Thank you. Asante Sana, I think that is a good, a very, very good area for us to get into the closing of uh, our session today. And also, and, um, um, also with that, uh, Dr. Mbaro at the Catholic University in Western Africa, and also just as we develop the, uh, the, the ongoing uh, engagement with uh, the, uh, the uh, mediators, and we are looking at uh, the development of conflict transformation uh, mediators, how can we be able to further these skills uh, and, 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 and I'm saying this because I know that as we uh, look into the topics that we are focusing on um, in the, um, as part of the conflict transformation coaching and these are our topics, um, some of them um, highlighted by our good professor, uh, uh, Professor Peter Gishure. Um, and these are not necessarily topics that are part of the training of mediators. How can we further these skills? Um, uh, are there resources that we can be able to tap into so that we can be able to now have develop this uh, conflict transformation mindset as professional mediators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Medito Wangari. Uh, my part in short is that um, we may need to look at what are some of the skills that um, professional mediators need to develop. Skills of like one, effective communication, skills on dialogue, managing a dialogue uh, session, listening skills, counseling skills. And I think all these are skills that definitely will be acquired by a professional mediator. Maybe in future, as people continue on developing themselves and acquiring, you know, that as capacity to mediate these are some of the skills and perhaps people who are coming from different uh, other different professionals can, uh, professions can also contribute and suggest some of the skills that we may need, uh, they may deem necessary uh, for uh, sharpening our uh, professional uh, profession as uh, you know uh, mediators so thank you very much and I wish the fellows a very good experience as they write and also the media as, as we continue enhancing our capacities in med mediation. So thank you very much, uh, Professor, for uh, uh, just uh, joining with us. Uh, thank you very much. And we really, really do appreciate it. And we're looking forward to next Saturday. So colleagues, please remember that the next session is next Saturday, which is on the Saturday, the 30th day of October in the year 2021. And the session will be at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So we have two lectures with uh, Dr. Mbaru uh, uh, during, as part of the conflict transformation uh, weekend. Um, a great tip that we have received, and uh, please make use of this tip because now we have now moved from our blog articles and now we are now focusing on our feature article. Uh, the feature article is the, is the article that is 1,000 to 1,200 words, which is on your fellowship topic. And uh, yeah, you are bringing out the framework that you are proposing for the area that is your uh, for your fellowship. And uh, the, what uh, Dr. Mbaru has actually highlighted to us is that if we can focus on our area of profession, our area of expertise, and we ask ourselves this one question, how can I effectively and eff efficiently transform conflict in that area? So the feature article that we are now uh, focusing on, which is due on November 1st, because we are preparing now for the uh, lead-in summit on November 19th to 20th, the feature article, let's ask ourselves this question. In that area that is our fellowship topic, how can I efficiently and effectively transform conflict? What is that framework? What is that theory? What is that Einstein that you introduce into the mediation work that is already um, ongoing. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you once again for joining us. Dr. Mbaru, uh, thank you for uh, uh, spending this time with us and our appreciation to the Catholic University of thank Eastern you. Africa. 
Yes, and uh, specifically the Center for Social Justice and Ethics, uh, to which you are the director for the great support that you give to uh, the, the development of mediation and you give uh, mediators a home um, in Kenya. So okay. with that, we will kindly, Asante sana, karibu. With that, we will kindly request you, uh, uh, Dr. Peter Mbaro, to kindly lead us in a word of prayer so that we can be able to close this session. And colleagues and friends, please have a blessed day. Dr. Mbaro. Thank you very much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty God and Father, as we start this session, we ask for your blessings, your guidance, and your inspiration through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that you have granted. We thank you. We ask you to be with us as mediators, and as we work to bring your kingdom of peace, your kingdom of justice in our societies, we ask you to be our guide, uh, to be our protector, and always inspire our minds and our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may become true instrument, instruments of your peace wherever we are, and that we may help our communities, we may help our families and even individuals to live joyfully every day and to achieve that perfection of life that your son desired for all of us when he said that he came in order for us to have life and have it in abundance. We therefore thank you and we ask you to bless us as we end this session and go back to our respective duties. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So once again, we wish you a blessed day and uh, thank you for joining us. God bless you. Asante. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.